Hi, back at Surfaces. Right now, we are on a screen. And since March of last year, it seems that, as Ham said twice in Endgame, after lamenting that he is on Earth, there's no cure for that. For us, educators and students, but also for millions of people, the world has transformed into a screen since the beginning of the global pandemic. Most, if not all aspects of our lives have been translated or transposed onto a flat surface on and which we talk and direct our gestures, messages, emotions, and so on. Zoom has become a verb referring not anymore to the approaching or distancing movement of a lens, but rather to the space where we live and communicate, that is to say, where we speak and listen to each other. Thus, the screen where we used to mostly type or write is the one on and to which we speak now. Given this life on the screen, it was only a matter of time for a production of a play by Beckett to not just be streamed after first being recorded at the theater, but rather to literally have its place in as ambience within the screen on which we all find each other together right now, the Zoom screen. This is the production of the new group of uh, Waiting for Godot that will begin streaming May 6, 2021, and which, given the stature of its actors, has been able to be promoted in TV shows as popular as The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. As we can imagine, the play is described in publications about it as, quote, fit for these harrowingly uncertain times, end of quote. An isolation is remarked as a resonant trait with our contemporary situation. However, what I want to focus on today is reflected rather in the misapprehension expressed by the idea attributed to Wallace Shawn, who plays Loki here, of quote unquote, performing it, into, uh, it, performing it into a void when what we mean is a screen, or in other words, a surface. But what exactly is a surface and a screen? And how do they appear or are drawn in Beckett's corpus? Given our time limit, I want to focus today on three surfaces only one from Text for Nothing 6, and two from Endgame. But first, I want to borrow the notion of ontopology from Elizabeth Essinger, who herself borrows it from Derrida, to begin to think the importance of the problem of the surface in Beckett. In her article, Beckett's Posthuman, The Ontopology of the Unnameable, she utilizes this term to examine the unsolvable enmeshment between ontology and topology in the unnameable in the context of a posthuman reading of the novel. What well, I consider like Ettinger that such enmeshment can and must be thought also in terms of isomorphism, which is relatable to the notion of individuation in Ludwig Simondon's work. I want to focus more concretely today on the strictly topological part of any ontology. Yet, instead of focusing on the power and knowledge tendencies of topology as she does, I want to consider it in its purely mathematical form as the science of surfaces and in its distinction from geometry and geography. In this way, seen through a topological lens, surfaces in Beckett are relatable and al analyzable regardless of the different matters of composition, making those of the ground, the page, the stage, a screen, or a canvas, potentially the same object. As I will try to show with our first surface, this very sameness, or same sameness, is what makes of the Beckettian logos or word such a difficult object or dimension, shared both by beings onto logi, and by spaces, topo logi. Let us go to the first surface. As I mentioned earlier, this surface appears within text for nothing six. Displacing is proper for such a surface since the short text focuses on spatiality as an absolute, and infinite here, it declares with no elsewhere. The surface, described as the slime, is reminiscent of how it is mud, and in its biblical allusion, it conflates both the soil of the creation in Genesis, performed by the Godfather, with the ground on which Jesus rose twice. It's only written words, by the way, in John 8, and in 8, 6, 8. And here is its textual appearance. Blood, words can be blotted, and the mad thoughts they invent. The nostalgia for that slime where the eternal breathed, and his song wrote, long after, with divine idiotic finger, at the feet of the adulteress. Wipe it out. All you have to do is say you said nothing, and so say nothing again." End of quote. As any Beckett scholar knows, the similarity of this slime where you can wipe its inscription down just by saying nothing 
with a magic pad or tablet is not gratuitous. One of the essential traits of Beckett's literary corpus, at least since the first trilogy, is the performance of a kind of writing or inscription bent on erasing itself and its possibilities. In this way, if this slimy or earthly surface is analogized with the surfaces of both the creation of the world and the Lord's written word, this conflation makes of both the material and the textual world an apparition on an erasable screen. In other words, say, write, or draw what you like, control Z, control Z, control Z, and you're good again. Our next surface is a disappearing one. You might read it in the text, but chances are you won't see it on the stage when you go to see the play. It appears without really appearing in the stage directions of Endgame Dosley. Quote, hanging near door, its face to wall, a picture, end of quote. And later, when Club is trying to find where to set up the alarm clock that will let Ham know if he left or died, the original text says that this picture is replaced by the alarm clock and put on the floor with its face against the wall. Here in the slide, we can see it still in the first stage. This is in the first staging of Endgame in Paris by Roger Blanc in 1957. While the picture disappeared as early as the Fact B edition of 1958, as well as in the Riverside production, it was briefly reinstated for the Shiraz Theater production in 1967 by Beckett. Needless to say, its lack of unveiling, the fact that it remains with its face to the wall, is the more significant in a play marked since the beginning by the act of uncovering and looking at different objects, bodies, ash bins, windows, barren landscapes, and even faces. Now, since Beckett did not give any concrete historical grounding to the play, disappearing any historical marker as it was his want, except perhaps for the enigmatic one in Kraft's last tape, quote, a late evening in the future, end of quote, we could easily imagine this turn around picture as a screen. Perhaps one of those frames, frames with li liquid-like moving images they sell for a dormant Etsy. What is more important, though, is that even if we do not imagine such a screen, it, in its own seamless and thus infinite possibilities, already behaves phenomenologically as one when we try to think about what it could be a picture of. A portrait of somebody special, a painting by Avigdor Arica, Bram or Gerd van Velde, Caspar Friedrich's two men contemplating the moon, Mr. Erskine's painting from what, or even a mirror, the most changing and unchanging surface. In other words, as it faces the wall, the wall throughout the play, and when Club literally takes its place to set up there the machine that will produce the oral signal of his departure or death, and even as it disappears and appears alternatively between productions, we cannot help but, looking at what we might perceive as an abyss, imagine its unimaginable image. Yet, I have promised you the poem. And so far, our two surfaces seem more geometric or geographic, at least as geographic or geometric as the whole pre-creation surface of the earth or an unseen canvas can be. Let us move on to our last surface, an old handkerchief. This rectangular fabric is the very first address he, an imagined, an imagined audience of Ham after he wakes up in Endgame. As we know, the play begins with Club uncovering and looking into first the windows, then the ash bins, and then finally Ham. Yet, even though he removes the sheet covering him, Ham, he leaves this handkerchief on his face. After Club leaves the room, quote, Ham steers, yawns under the handkerchief. He removes the handkerchief from his face, end of quote, and then says, quote, me, he yawns to play. He holds the handkerchief spread out before him, end of quote. And addresses it, quote, all stancher, end of quote. Following Beckett's love for apparent symmetry, the play ends in a similar way when, after yelling for club and not receiving any answer, he addresses the handkerchief again, quote, from the end of the play, club, Long pause. No, good. He takes out the handkerchief. Since that's the way we're playing it, he unfolds it. Let's play it that way. He unfolds. And speak no more about it. He finishes unfolding. Speak no more. He holds handkerchief spread out before him. Old stancher. Pause. You remain. Pause. He covers his face with handkerchief, 
lowers his arms to armrest, remains motionless. Freeze tableau, curtain. End of quote. Between these two framing appearances, the handkerchief is exhibited again in a similar fashion at another point in the play. That is to say, Sam holds it spread out before him, like representing it to the real audience as a painting or an empty canvas. Here, this gesture is framed by a repetition of the initial statement, me, the play, and the corroboration, we are getting on. Referring, as we know, to both the play of Endgame itself and to the story Han is telling. <clears throat> In this part of the story, Han reflects on all those he, quote, might have helped, end of quote, or saved. He refers to them as a multi multiplicity similar to ants or insects, quote, the place was crawling with them, end of quote. Then he gets exasperated with himself and repeats what has become a cliche among the Hessian quotes. Quote, use your head, can you? Use your head. You are on earth. There's no cure for that. Quote. He then alternates between a couple of calm and violent admonitions to himself and or to these imagined multitudes. Quote, get out of here and love one another. Lick your neighbor as yourself. Pause. Calm when it wasn't bread they wanted, it was crumpets. Pause violently. Out of my sight and back to your petty parties. Pause. All that, all that. Pause. And of course. Then he expresses a realization or acknowledgement of the falseness or fictional character of his performance with club during the whole play. Quote, not even a real dog. Come. And of course. And then finally, he utters another commonly quoted Beckettian statement that seems to refer to a certain interminability, if not circularity of time or history. Quote, the end is in the beginning, and yet you go on. End of quote. Now, since in this occasion he did not use the handkerchief to clean his glasses, why exhibit it here? After all, what is a handkerchief? Well, geometrically, a handkerchief is a rectangle. Topologically, it is something more. If you fold it and glue its vectors, you can turn it into a cylinder, similar to the one of the lost one. Quote, a flattened cylinder 50 meters round and 16 high for the sake of harmony, end of quote. Or if you introduce a little twist, you can glue the same vector, but on its opposite side, creating a Mobius strip, the common and topological symbol for infinite time. As we know, on this particular surface, the end is truly, but especially superficially, in the beginning, and yet you go on. <clears throat> if you then glue the circular ends of the cylinder made from the rectangle, you can make a torus, one of Lacan's favorite top topological figures to describe the subject. However, notwithstanding the great work that colleagues like Arkasha Padaya and Llewellyn Brown have made on Lacan and Beckett, right now, and for as long as we are on a flat screen, our own modus strip, I want to remain strictly on the surface. That is to say, on the topos of Beckett and its logic, and not on its ontology. Both the Lacanian subject topology and a great study, such as Mark Byron's recent Samuel Beckett's geological imagination, invite us to consider the surfaces in themselves before any notion or complication of a subject, that is to say, before any knot appears. After all, there is no subject as subjectus thrown down, nor any objectum thrown before, and Pachi Cristeva, not even an, any objectus in between, without a surface or a plane where it falls or is marked. The unnameable says as much when it defines itself as the partition. Quote, I'm in the middle, I'm the partition, I have two surfaces and no thickness, end of quote. In other words, I am a handkerchief and all stanchure. Yet, when one is on a surface, especially on an infinite one as a sphere or a screen, as we are right now. Is it possible to examine or even consider the surface in itself without subjects or objects? On the apparent stasis in which we find ourselves these days, standing stable, but also as the Greek static implies, opposing, contesting, rising, can we see and think where we st are standing, say on, without really projecting ourselves on it? Can we think the where, where we will have been already reflected, projected, and waited or fallen, know how on? Quote, the end is in the beginning, and yet you go on. Pause. 
perhaps I could go on with my story, end it and begin another. But perhaps I could throw myself out on the floor. And of course, or are we always on a surface like the voice in text for nothing big, inhabiting, it, inhabiting, inhabiting an infinite fear, rejected in front of the impossibility of going someplace else? Quote, it's buried. My life is buried. I'll never get anywhere, I know. There is no one here, neither me nor anyone else. But some things are better left unsaid, so I say nothing. Elsewhere, perhaps, by all means, elsewhere. What elsewhere can there be to this infinite fear? End of quote. It could be that this is the lesson and resonance of Beckett surfaces to us now in 2021. As long as we are on this infinite fear, on the infinite surface, cylinder, mobile strip, handkerchief, or zoom screen, we do not know and we cannot know if this is a worldly circle or a subject, subjective knot. Or, as a mathematician explains it, quote, as the ant moves around either the knot or trefoil, it has a sense of being on a loop. But the ant has no notion of whether it is living on a knot. It is only by being, to, by being able to view things from outside the two loops and looking on from a position in the ambient space that we are able to recognize one loop as knotted as compared with the other, end of quote. Crawling by the millions on a screen that are stages, but also the whole earth, we believe there are two surfaces an inside and an outside. But we do not yet know if we walk on a simple circle, repeating it all, or if this is a knot that has already created certain sub or objectivity. While time seems cyclical, again, this is the beginning, it is rather the same spatiality of our surface that keeps our Beckettian continu continuity always on, as well as, if this is a non-orientable surface, no. Or over and there. Over, over, there is a soft place in my heart for all that is over. No, for the being over, I love the world. Words have been my only loves, not many. Often all day long as I went along, I have said it, and sometimes I will be saying, pero, oh, pero, end quote. Over and pero, on and no. The Beckettian surface is topologically non-orientable. That is to say, on it, it is possible to reverse the sense of any loop or circle. What is not possible is to ever abandon this reversible surface or this surface without orient, where the end is in the beginning, and yet always we go on and know. Thank you.